Welcome to the Anatomy Dissection Laboratory for Students. Today's lesson is on the dissection of the face. Dr. Carlos suarez and Joe Valensky are the authors of this presentation. Dr. suarez is your narrator. God has given you one face, and you make yourself another? Alas, poor Hamlet, he's not the only one who met treachery in this world. We express our emotions, good and bad, using the muscles of facial expression, which we will dissect in this section. Let's start the dissection of the superficial face, our window to the world. As shown here, Incisions are made in the skin of the face prior to its removal. The skin of the face is tightly adherent to the superficial fascia, but when possible, it is removed without disturbing this fascia because the facial muscles are located within the superficial fascia. After much tedious work, the intact superficial fascia is shown here after skin removal. The muscles of facial expression are all derived from a single muscular sheet and thus are poorly differentiated from each other. Here we see some of the named muscles of the face. The frontalis allows us to frown, as when we are asked difficult questions to ponder. It also gives us those unsightly wrinkles that show our age. Perhaps that is why some people light votive candles to the Botox gods. Injections every three months will eliminate those wrinkles, and you will learn in this video where to avoid making these injections. The orbicularis oculi closes the upper lid, and if it is paralyzed, the cornea may become dry and ulcerated. The levator lavi superioris and the sagomaticus major help a snarl, while the orbicularis oris allows us to pucker our lips. The depressor angular oris and the mentalis let us show displeasure by allowing us to turn our lower lips outwards in a frown. Clearly, all this occurs because one attachment of the muscles is to the skin of our face and is the reason that dissection of the face is so tedious. Removal of the skin and superficial fascia often destroys these muscles. One final point to make about these muscles. All of the facial muscles are innervated by the facial nerve, and this nerve is commonly, temporarily, compromised in Bell palsy. And where do we find the nerves that innervate all these muscles? Here we can see the many branches of the facial nerve emanating from the interior border of the parotid gland. Depending on which textbook you use, you will read that there are either five or six branches of the facial nerve that extend to all the muscles of facial expression. Note also the superficial temporal artery and the auriculotemporal nerve. This nerve is a branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve and supplies the surrounding area with sensation. It is sometimes difficult to find, but it's an important nerve in that it sends parasympathetic outflow to the main salivary gland, the parotid gland, before reaching this location. Finally, you might be wondering how it is possible to find all these nerves in the cadaver. Generally, the parotid duct is often found early in the dissection and the facial nerve main trunk is associated with the duct. Once you find this main trunk, it is possible to tease out the remaining branches. Now imagine doing this on a patient who has a parotid cancer, and you are trying to preserve as many of these nerves as possible so as not to disfigure your patient. The facial artery and vein supply and drain the face with blood. Note how the facial artery meanders around the side of the mouth. Can you come up with a reason why it would do that? What would happen every time you open your mouth if it didn't? So this meandering allows the mouth to open 
without rupturing the artery. Also note in this image the depressor angular aureus muscle. This muscle is innervated by a small branch of the facial nerve that is liable to be transected during a cosmetic facelift. Surprisingly, this is a serious complication because without this muscle, the patient cannot smile well because the muscle that allow you to smile, such as the zygomaticus major, needs some stability at the corner of the mouth in order to produce a good smile. If you smile and put your fingers under the corner of your mouth, you will feel the depressor angular contract. While still looking at the same image, focus your attention on the parotid duct that sits just lateral to the large muscle you use to bite down on your food, the masseter muscle. Note how the duct makes a 90 degree turn, just anterior to the masseter muscle. The duct will pierce a muscle forming your cheek, the buccinator, and then enter the vestibule of the mouth to deposit saliva required for the initial steps of digestion. If you ever played a wind instrument, you are likely taught to control this muscle when blowing out so as not to damage the buccinator. If you wish to see how not to play a wind instrument, look up Dissy Gillespie in YouTube and see how his cheeks puff out. Dissy was self-taught and was never taught proper embouchure. Paradoxically, Dissy was the man who taught us how the trumpet should sound. Also, Given that the buccinator is a muscle of facial expression, it will be innervated by the facial nerve. In contrast, the masseter is a muscle of mastication and the trigeminal nerve innervates these muscles. In a different dissection, we again see the parotid gland. As a review, I wish to reiterate that the parotid gland is the largest salivary gland. Its secretions pass into the mouth via the parotid duct. The facial nerve traverses through the gland, those patients who have to have their parotid gland removed because of cancer run the risk of complete facial paralysis on the affected side. In this dissection, most of the parotid gland has been removed to reveal the stem of the facial nerve exiting the stylomastoid foramen to enter the face. The stylomastoid foramen is the termination of the bony facial canal in which inflammation of the facial nerve in this tight space is thought to result in Bell palsy. During the 19th century, historical records indicate that some older women sometimes did not mind getting Bell palsy because the loss of facial muscle tone was accompanied by loss of skin wrinkles. Of course, understand that Bell palsy is also associated with drooling of saliva and dry eyes so perhaps this is more of an apocryphal description that remains in the medical literature. The supraorbital nerve is a terminal branch of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and supplies the skin of the forehead with sensation. It is found by reflecting the skin, superficial fascia, and frontalis muscle inferiorly. Here, we can see this nerve exiting from the supraorbital foramen. Also seen here is the supratrochlear nerve, which is a similar part of the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve and supplies the skin around the medial aspect of the orbit with sensation. And yes, these are the nerves that dermatologists try to avoid when injecting Botox to remove the wrinkles generated by the frontalis muscle. Bottom line, stay laterally to avoid these nerves. The infraorbital nerve is a terminal branch of the maxillary division of the trigeminal nerve. It supplies a mid-face region with sensation. It is found by reflecting a flap of skin, superficial fascia, and muscle from below the orbit. Here we can see the infraorbital nerve exiting the infraorbital foramen. This location makes the nerve susceptible to injury in fractures of the floor of the orbit. And later, we will see the proximity of the nerve to the maxillary sinus and come to realize why a painful tooth infection may manifest itself in the sensation of swelling within the orbit. The final nerve that supplies the face with sensation is the mental nerve, which is a terminal branch of the mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. 
as shown here, the mental nerve comes onto the face by exiting from the mental foramen in the body of the mandible. And you do know why it is called the mental nerve. It is difficult to have a deep thought without first grabbing your chin. Think of Rodin, the thinker. In older adults who lose their bottom teeth, much of the bone of the mandible above the foramen is resorbed and the foramen comes to lie directly opposite the teeth of the upper jaw. This results in intense pain for the patient every time they chew, and this, in turn, leads to severe malnutrition and loss of body fat. Finally, this slide shows how the supraorbital, infraorbital, and mental nerve are located virtually in a straight vertical line with each other. Why is this so? If you couldn't come up with a reason, that is good, because we don't know either. Also, this straight line relationship is completely lost in individuals who become edentulate. The mandible thins out, and the mental foramen is no longer in a straight line with the superior and inferior orbital foramina. This now concludes the dissection of the face. Hope you enjoyed the historical comments.